got so many clients today that have just gone completely virtual with their site visits because we, they've just dialed the sales process in so so well. Like you don't need a lot of stuff. You just need internet. Massive. It's a lot more accepted these days with what happened with COVID and yeah. work from home and video meetings and whatever. People are used to doing FaceTime calls and used to doing Zoom yeah. calls. So why not, why not use it? Linton, welcome back to the Site Show podcast. Thank you, Matt. It's been a little while since I've since I've been on here, mate. How long's it been? Eighteenth of February, two thousand and sixteen. <laughs> you you were episode seven, eight, nine, and ten. You, you interviewed me on my <laughs> own podcast. Right. Yeah, I interviewed you. That's seven, right. eight, wow. Eight, seven, that seems like a lifetime ago. Yeah, I know that's 2016. Holy crap, that's crazy. Yeah. And now, yeah. so it's, that's that's yeah. What do we know? 2024. So holy shit, that's eight years ago. Mm. Yeah, wow, a little bit, a little bit happened years. since then. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> hey, welcome back. That's you are from back. you are from Trady Pad. You guys are all things cloud uh, solutions for uh, trade businesses. Which actually, you're probably better off giving your own spiel. Thank you. I've done I've done that a few times now as well. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Let me hit mute. Uh, <laughs> all about um, apps and technology for tradies. So ex plumber like you, so must be a good bloke. And uh, yeah, saw, saw that technology was was going to change the way that tradies did business back in God 2011, 2012 when iPads first came out, and uh, and started to play with apps and and got a system all set up for the plumbing business that I was involved in, and and it just changed everything. So. I, uh, I saw an opportunity to help other tradies understand how to use technology to to run their business and change their life, and the rest is history. So, yeah, we've been running for over 10 years now. We've got thousands of clients across Australia, New Zealand, uh, internationally now as well. And, uh, and, yeah, it's all about helping people find the right solutions for their business and teaching them how to use it. Amazing. Yeah, it's one of those things. I mean, I suppose now it's almost um... – it's almost expected that people are using some sort of tech in their business, but like back in the day, it was pretty pretty new and pretty innovative. And I mean, it's like I remember when I, you know, we, we set businesses up, and I, I know you guys too. Like, well, new businesses, we'll set them up with something real basic, like Google Workspace, and like they don't know anything different. Like, they've never had to deal with server based emails. I have to deal with GoDaddy support or like. Yeah. And you just, it's just so funny because you just think, you guys just don't know how good you've got it. You can hear my, like, what is that? <laughs> That's my cat having a fit. <laughs> Classic. The, yeah. office, the office assistant is having a fit. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> Popping up a verbal. That's great. Um, um, yeah, you're right. It's, um, yeah, it, it's it is a given these days. But think back to two thousand and sixteen, and even earlier when we first started. Like it was so early; it mm. was probably a little bit too early. Yeah. But we had we had plenty of early adopters as clients in those days that could see that that technology was going was going to benefit them. And it's like you said, something as simple as Google Workspace makes a massive difference to people's efficiency and and accessibility to their emails and responsiveness to clients and. Like even something as little as that makes a huge difference mm. when you compare it to the old methods of email, like the old big ponds and um, the old hot mails and stuff. So, um, mm. so yeah, it's uh, that gets the cat again. I'm gonna have to kick the cat out. Fine, podcasting. It's meant to be raw. <laughs> it's very real. Let, just let the dog in. <laughs> so anyway, we're here today. We're going to be talking about uh, quoting versus estimating. Um, and something I suppose which is pretty close to home to me at the moment too. Like we do a lot of um, a lot of that, a lot of training with our clients in the on the sales process of you know what we do for when they were generating them you know leads and stuff. And that, that's like a big thing. Like big part of our sales process is the you know estimate at this point and then quote at this point kind of thing. And so I'm I'm super keen to hear what you guys have to say. And most of them most of them are probably your clients anyway. Uh, I know we we share quite a few, but um, it's good to 
<laughs> it sounds like a duck. <laughs> what with your cat? <laughs> That's... Hell. That's so good. I'm not even going to edit that. It's so funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm working from home. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, yeah, in the first episode, we're going to talk about estimating versus, versus quoting. And then in the next episode, we're going to touch a little bit more on like how you can implement and amalgamate some of these tools into your existing technology stack, you know, for yeah. um to make a practical application, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I thought it was really important for us to kind of um, lay the groundwork of of knowledge and education in this, this first part because it's a real... Um, I wouldn't say a gray area, but it's an area that <laughs> I'm going to have to do something about this. <laughs> oh, classic. Oh, dear. It's an area that um, there's different thoughts and ideas and different um, perspectives on it. You know, when I, quite often I talk to people and we talk about quoting and people think of it in different ways. And so it's important that we kind of lay out a groundwork mm. of um, of knowledge so that we're all talking the same language. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I get it. <clears throat> I mean, from my understanding, estimating is, as it suggests, it's an estimate. And so when we're talking with our clients and we're like, okay, at this point, you want to be able to give the customer an estimate so they kind of know what the sort of price bracket they're in so that if they don't have the budget, you know about it now and you don't waste any more time with them. That's kind of our positioning on estimating whereas and then at a certain point in the process we're like okay now give them a quote at this point because they know the price and they're already expecting it and you've done a bit more digging a bit more homework yeah that's one way to look at it and this yeah. is perfect is exactly why we're talking about this because when we think about it from a technology and software perspective estimating is kind of the process that you go through to work out and and depending on whether it's estimating and quoting a service and maintenance style job Job yeah. or project style job, but if we're talking about a project style job, the estimating part is getting the plans or getting the scope of works yeah. and putting together, breaking it down and putting together the calculation part. Mm -hmm. So the estimate of what is the material we need, what is the labor that we need, what are the subbies we're going to need, what's all that part, doing the calculation piece and then putting together the quote and the quote is like the client facing piece. So I think the estimating part, if we're estimating project style work, the estimating part is the calculation and the quoting part is the customer facing side. Yeah, interesting. And there's software that can do both. So there's estimating software that will let you import a set of plans and let you do takeoffs and count quantities, things like that, things like ground plan um, and cost decks. There's a bunch of estimating tools and they'll then typically give you a number or a, a value that you'll then use to build your quote. And then this is where the job or the project management software comes in. You, you'll create your quote in your job or project management software, whatever you're using. So there's yeah, two there completely different perspectives on estimating and quoting, depending on where kind of where you're looking at it from. Mm. Yeah, I guess one of the big... And you would have probably more insight to this than we would. Or maybe not. Like we, we're, we're really big with... I mean, you take builders, for example, right? And that whole estimating process is is considerable. And we firmly believe they should be getting charged for it. So we've got a process to help them do that. Yeah. Pat, do you... So run us through how that looks for the, the guys that, that you work with in that space. Because, I mean, I know some of our builders will spend, you know, two weeks preparing some of these estimates. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it, and it varies massively. Like I had a yeah. conversation just last week with a builder who's been doing his own estimating and quoting, and he's at a point now where he wants to outsource that. So there are outsourced estimating companies that you can mm. use. You send them the plans and they'll do the takeoff and the breakdown and the estimate and give you the value and then you can create the quote. Um, so, yeah, it, it varies massively depending on how you quote because there's different ways or estimate. There's different ways of breaking it down. Some people will break it down into what is the labor and materials that I need. So they'll look at each part of the project and go, okay, it's this much labor, it's this much material. A lot of people will have rates that they use where they'll do the measurements and they'll have lineal meter rates and square meter rates for all the different things that they do. It might be framing and concreting and mm -hmm. roofing point rates for plumbing and there's so many different ways to calculate and this is where it becomes tricky with software because a lot of people think that these estimating tools that they buy this magic wand that they yeah, can plug and play yeah and it comes up with this 
accurate number that you can put all your faith in. But when it comes down to it, the numbers that come out of systems like that, out of software like that, have to be accurate. They have to be spot on. If they're under, you're going to do your ass on the project. If they're over, you're not going to get the work. So you've got to be confident and have faith in the information that's going in, the information that's coming out. So you've typically got to spend a lot of time with these software, these estimating and quoting software tools to make sure that you're confident in the numbers that it's spitting out. Mm -hmm. so you've either got to build the rates or you've got to build out the structure and the components of it so that what's going in is accurate with what's coming out. Um, yeah, so it's interesting how you, I mean, you're talking about the different variables like with from business to business, like how how customizable and how like malleable are some of these tools to suit you know the individual businesses, like different processes they have for different things. Uh, yeah, most of them are like I guess ad adjustable to suit the way you do it, the way you quote. Like we think about it, think about the job management systems mm. and some of the the tools that are available in those. When I build a quote, so if I do the breakdown, I'll say, say I've just got room one, room two, room three as three different sections in my quote, and then I want to um, break it down from there, I'll have, I can just add in labor and I can add in my, all my materials, like a bill of materials if I want, or some tools will have what they call kits or assemblies or pre-builds, depending on which system you use, and that'll be like a combination of labor and materials components, like supply and install a 250 liter hot water heater oh yeah, and that heat rate kind of yeah kind of like that yeah and it can be for all sorts of different things it can be a, like a linear meter of cable tray or a, a linear meter of drainage mm -hmm. at a certain depth it's like you've got rates and those rates are made up of components so you've got this much labor and you've got all these bits of material that make up that one unit of that kit so yeah the systems are very um configurable depending on the way that you want to quote you can break a, a quote down into the labor and the materials that's required so you can put in your labor hours and the bill of materials and all the kind of breakdown of all the bits and pieces um, so it's kind of traditional labor and materials structure or if you quote based on rates you can build what they call kits or recipes or pre-builds or whatever they are uh, which are like combinations of labor and materials and you're kind of like a supply and install of a 250 liter hot water heater or install a linear meter of cable tray or whatever it might be like that. And that way you then do your measurements off your plans and you just use the kits that you've built and created that are customized to the way that you want to do things. Mm -hmm. But the only problem with that is you've got to kind of build them. It takes time to build them and be confident in the numbers that are coming out. So we'll come back to kits and recipes later on. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, so I think you... go ahead. I think to... I think if we go... But go back to kind of the basics of it, with the types of quotes that people are doing, there's a very big difference between quoting a service and maintenance style job mm. versus quoting project work and different workflows associated mm -hmm. with those. Um, obviously with a project, it's a much longer process. There's a lot more things to consider. Whereas when you're quoting service and maintenance work, it's like you were saying before, it's just giving the client the idea of the price and getting yeah. that price objection and discussion out of the way at the start and you've then got a fixed price that you're working to. So just different types of quotes mm. and different tools can create those quotes for you depending on how detailed they are. Like the service mate does simple quotes. Um, Simpro can do really detailed and complex quotes that are broken down into lots of different bits. I mean, a lot of those tools, I'm guessing we'll talk about more of that on the next episode when we dive a little bit more into the tech stack side of things. But I mean, a lot of those softwares enable you to turn a estimate into a quote and a quote into an invoice. And I mean, even Zero, I think, does that, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, it does. Um, difference between a job management system doing a quote and something like Zero doing a quote is really the detail that's in the background. Because yeah. yeah, sure. when you build your quote in Zero or any of the accounting packages or the simpler job management tools, all you're really doing is just putting some line items in with a value associated with them. Whereas when you build a quote in something like Simpro or Score or Airflow or whatever, You've got you're able to do the calculation where you can break down all the different components and have cost price, sell price, some visibility of what your forecasted margin is, group things together into sections or components, um, and then control what the client sees on the PDF that actually gets produced, which is the quote that you send to them. 
So there's a lot more detail and control in a quote coming out of a job management system than what you can do out of an accounting package. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's it's like anything. It's just having the right tool for the job, depending on what you what you want to do. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> with the um, what are some of the things I suppose that people should be out there considering when you're? Is this? Do you feel like this conversation is sort of slightly more geared towards the bigger sort of style projects where the those estimates are more, um, like as you as you mentioned earlier in the recording, like they're more about getting everything prepared for the client facing quote, or is this something that's kind of relevant to, you know, like every, every like it's job smaller business businesses that do jobs day to day as well as the bigger projects. I think so because if you're if you're a small business and you're doing small service and maintenance work and you're doing quoted work you still want to have some visibility of how did we actually go on that on that job that we quoted so one another difference between doing a quote in your accounting package versus doing it in a job management system is a job management system can then give you some ability to track actual cost right. versus what you've quoted so as long as you're tracking your time that you spend and the material costs against that job you can say okay we quoted a thousand bucks for this it's actually cost us 950 bucks we've made bugger all the accounting package can't do that accounting package is not going to give you that kind of costing breakdown um in comparison to what you'd what you quoted um but i guess it just it comes down to the level of detail you want i talked to a lot of people that go you know i just want to be able to create a quote and go and do the work and then move on to the next job i don't want to worry about costings yeah so in that instance then okay sweet just do it in zero it's easy but it's all those other i guess the other functions of a job management system that that support the quote. So the ability to communicate with the client, automations around following up the quote, scheduling the job, oh. tracking the job. It's all those other kind of bits that go along with it. So yes, it's to answer your question, it's absolutely relevant for small businesses and service and maintenance style businesses. It's, it's just a different perspective on it and a different structure to someone that's doing big projects. So is all those other little things you just mentioned then, is that something you want to cover off on in the next, expand on in the next episode or is it something we, yeah. you want to dive into now? Okay. No, uh, we'll talk about that in, in the next mm. episode because that's, I guess it's a bit more of the technology side yeah. of the functions that go along with quoting. Um, but it's, what, it is what, interesting though that you mentioned those different methods of like communication as part of like the the the, the estimating and quoting process. You know, because obviously different clients respond, but people will respond differently to different mediums. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think one thing I wanted to highlight with this discussion today was the the old way versus the new way. Yeah. So the different workflows associated with how people used to quote and and interact with their clients versus what you can do now. And so communication is a huge part of it. Some people will want to receive the quote via email or SMS. Some people will actually want it written out. Um, it, it just <laughs> depends on the client. But the traditional workflow, the old way of doing things, which was client rings up, you go out and inspect the site, take some notes, and then go away and come back to the office and put something together and then send it to them yeah. and wait for them to receive it. You might follow them up. A lot of people didn't follow up, so they weren't calling the client to see if they've got the quote um just wait for them to call and say yes or no whereas the new workflow because we can do all of this stuff on site you can go out and see the client do your site inspection build the quote there and then on a device and actually show it to them and go through it with them and answer any questions and answer any objections and I guess have a sales process and a whole sales methodology where you're actually closing the sale while you're there Mm-hmm. Taking a deposit payment, you know, maybe even doing the work while you're there, just depends on how much work's involved, mm-hmm. but at least closing the sale, taking a payment, booking in the next visit. So you, you, it's a much better customer experience than I'll come and see you and I'll send you a quote and then I'll probably never hear from you again. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up because it's it's one of the, I mean, I, I think that's actually the reason why I, I even re- reached out to you in the first place was to talk more about that sort of dynamic because we're seeing like more and more the ability to stop wasting people's time is is getting is is resulting directly in just fantastic results across the board from customer experience through to cash collected jobs locked in and that whole you know old style of okay 
and, and this is most of the cu customers that we, you know, that, that we'll, we'll work with initially when they come to us, they'll be doing similar to what you said then where, you know, they might get a referral, they'll go out, they'll measure up without proper, doing a proper discovery, without really figuring out, okay, is this project worth my time going out there to um, investigate? They, yeah. a lot of them kind of see the metric for success in the sales process, the number of site visits they've done. And yeah. like our our mindset with that is it's not, that is not your metric of success. Your metric for success is taking a deposit or whatever yeah. your version of that is while you're on site. And in order to do that, you've got to have your discovery down. You've got to make sure that, you know, they're, you're asking the right questions in the early stages so that when that you have a high probability and like our, our expectation for our clients is to be closing a minimum of 50% when they get to site. Because if they've done their discovery right, they should be, you know, and if they're using our yeah. process, they're like, it, it'll it'll facilitate that. We've got clients that are closing 100%, you know, but the, the, the point is people don't have a lot of uh, time. And just because we've done something a certain way for forever doesn't mean that it shouldn't be changed. And like the, the clients appreciate being able to have someone who can come to site if they understand the process. And that's the key thing as well. Like in discovery, if you explain and you ma ma manage the objections before they become objections, like explain to them what's going to happen next. When you come out on site, we're going to do a site visit. We're going to do a site audit. We're going to present you with our, like you're going to be presented with the scheduling fee, which can lock you in for the job and like all this kind of stuff. Like it's just, it's transformative, you know, because there's never any, like they know what's coming. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I guess that's very much the new way of doing things. Cause I think back to when, when we were plumbing, yeah, that was <laughs> not normal. Yeah. Carb, write it, <laughs> write it out on a carbon copy notebook thing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's true. And I mean, and then you look at, so, and, and then the difference then, I suppose from, you know, the, the listeners and viewers out there that are list, like tuning in today, like the difference for you guys is you either go out there and you do your, you know, your site visit and then you bugger off and then you go and prepare a, a quote or an estimate or whatever it is, and then you send it off a few days later and then you go through a whole follow-up process or likely you probably don't go through the follow-up process, which is yeah. basically what you just said before. Mm -hmm. The difference is you, you go out, you turn your site visit into a sales call really, where you go out there and you, you're collecting a payment to secure that individual as a client, that business as a client, get them locked into a schedule and worry about all the other shit after. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a change in mindset and the change in the way that you approach it and using the technology tools to help support it as well. So communicating with the client about what the process totally. is, you might have an email template set up in your system where when the client calls, you can send them that information really simply and easily that gives them the full breakdown of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you might then ask them for some some information, Get send me some photos of the job or send me a video of the job or as much information as you can gather so you can qualify them initially and make the decision on whether you want to spend the time to actually go out there and spend the time on site because otherwise you're driving around the countryside for nothing. And truthfully, you may even find you don't have to. You know, we've got so many clients today that have just gone completely virtual with their site visits because we they've just dialed the sales process in so, so well and they've got the tech stack, which truthfully, the tech stack for a site visit is a phone. Like you don't need a lot of stuff you just need internet and <laughs> the ability to have, i mean and look it won't suit everyone you're going to get that perhaps the older demographics that may not you know respond well to that kind of approach but for the i mean even if it's a like even if it's a percentage that you can do 50 percent, you know virtual like it's a huge time saving a huge resource saving massive yeah, and it's, it's a lot more accepted these days with what happened with COVID and yeah. work from home and video meetings and whatever. People are used to doing FaceTime calls and used to doing Zoom yeah. calls. So why not why not use it? I think the biggest hurdle for that for people is is their lack of understanding of it and yeah. being they don't understand it, so they're not going to use it with their clients. But spend the time to learn it. Now we do video meetings all day, every day with our clients. We have clients all over Australia, and New Zealand. And our first meeting, the first scoping that we have is always on Zoom because it's introducing the concept from the start because we do so much training that way. Yeah. So if you haven't done online meetings or or FaceTime calls or Zoom meetings or whatever, just get started with it. It's not yeah. hard. It's You're watching a podcast, it's essentially like doing a Zoom meeting. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's just getting started with it and then working out how to adopt that into your process. Yeah. So I guess like I'll, just going back to you know, the way that 
like we we see it an alien with clients that are dealing slightly on the smaller s- scale of projects with the estimating versus quoting like like i was saying earlier the we they like the the estimating approach is really a way that they can um, let the clients know sort of within what sort of range their services may fall Bit just of a ballpark f- figure to ballpark qualify. yeah whatever you want to call it um yeah. to to figure out if that's you know sort of uh, gonna gonna fly for them, you know, if they can afford it, or if it's in their budget, in their budget. or whatever it might be. Yeah, and then further, like the down down the track, once you've done a bit more digging, and perhaps this normally happens after a site visit of some description, virtual or otherwise. You know, when you've actually got all of the details, um, you know, then you can more comfortably give them with a accurate quote. Yeah. So you do the calculation part, and then produce the quote that the client sees. Yeah. And that calculation part can be done in so many different ways. A lot of people do it in Excel right? because uh, that's what they're used to. They might do it on pen and paper because that's what they're used to. It's just breaking it down and just working out what, what, it, how am I going to price this job based yeah. on what I've got to do? Is it labor and materials? Is it your point rates or square meter rates or whatever it is? But it's just doing that calculation piece, which is typically internal client doesn't see any of that, but then generating the quote that the client sees. And that might just be a simple PDF But there's now software like ServiceMate, for example, can produce proposals, which are a lot more richer content. So it can have photos, it can have videos, you can have like a gallery of information, you can have optional items. It's like it's online, it's interactive. So you send it to the client, they click on a link to view it, and it's a whole proposal with information about your business. And it's, it's it's very different to just a PDF quote. Yeah, that you generate in you know, Word or even a job management system and send it off. Mm-hmm. So just different. There's a, a range of different ways of generating that customer facing piece. Mm. Yeah, and we we're just really big on like the whole quoting process as such. I mean, again, sort of parlaying this back into jobs as opposed to you know bigger projects. Yeah, I just think the whole quoting send me a quote thing is done. Like mm. it's just a it's a smokescreen excuse for I'm not ready to commit right now or <laughs> I'm I don't really, some tires. <laughs> I'm not really giving you the right answer or I'm just gonna be shopping around, you know. Yeah. And so we're just trying to mitigate all that and skip that entire thing because it's really all it means is you've just got to prepare this quote and then follow them up forever or not follow them up. Or they just take that and give it to someone else who's gonna either beat it or, you know, whatever. Like yeah. I just think that whole that whole part of the that, that sort of sales style is fractured. I agree. And quite so often we'll work with a client that's been using a job management system for a while and they'll have hundreds and hundreds of quotes in the system. They're all yeah. still open. Yeah, and, exactly. And they're just in there clogging up the system. They haven't spoken to them for two years or three years, yeah. but it's still an open quote because it's never been closed off. Yeah, exactly. That's a really important process to put into the business to A, follow up the client and B, have a point at where you say, righto, that quote is done, it's closed, um, expired or cancelled or whatever you want to call it, and it gets put into the archive. You don't delete it, but you move it into the archive so it's not clogging up the system. You yeah. can always go and find it later on if you want to, yeah. but it's having that kind of line in the sand where you say, righto, it's been two months, we haven't heard from them, we follow them up or we haven't followed them up, but I'm going to put it into the archive and I can always go back to it if I need to, but just close it off so it's not clogging up the system because it's like I'll use service mode as an example. If you've got lots and lots and lots of open jobs, um, it just slows everything down and makes it harder to find stuff. So just close yeah. it. Yeah, it's um, and I, and I say this to clients as well. Like it, it doesn't always mean like if a if a contact if a lead comes to you and you've got a proposal out there, an opportunity that's been created or whatever. And they don't go ahead with that opportunity at that point in time. It doesn't necessarily mean that that contact is a dud. It just means at that point in time, that opportunity is not right for them. And so, you know, it's important, I think, to have like the smarts and the technology in play where you can, sure, d- close off that opportunity, whatever you say, so, say you've got like a two week term on that or whatever it might be. And if you've quoted something, you would want to do that because you don't want to have open. <laughs> You wouldn't want to have quoted something and have all these prices go up and all of a sudden you're left yeah. shorthanded if they accept it. So, 100%. Um, so you can close the opportunity, but the contact, that's your opportunity to nurture and keep them, I suppose, is as part of your marketing database, you know, and, and, and you should apply attention to that. It's important. 
Yeah, absolutely. This is a good segue back into your side of the court, I suppose, in that that marketing side of things and the tools that you use for that because that's what job management systems aren't so good at. Mm. Like you can have a list of customers in there and a list of quotes. But it's not very good at the email marketing and nurturing piece. And this is something we've talked about for years is this whole connection between the job management system and the data that's in there and your and your um uh, and your CRM and your marketing tools mm-hmm. and that whole workflow around nurturing the clients and getting to the to the point of buying. Yeah. Um, so I think I think having that as part of the process of the contact record and the customer and the quote information flowing back into the CRM to do that marketing piece. Yeah, I think very often, like we see, it's it's really common that businesses will they have this mentality around more leads and more leads and more leads, which is is fine, but it shouldn't come at the cost of the existing contacts. Well, I'm yet to see like we ran a um, you know reengagement campaign for a client just before Christmas, and he messaged us a couple of days ago. That that campaign we ran um, generated us 250k, you know, wow. in the space of a week. No. I've yet to see a, a proper, a well done reengagement campaign not work, not generate income. It's every time it does, but no. most people neglect that, and maybe they neglect it because it's um, it's too hard, or they don't have the right tech in place. You know. Yep, I think a bit of both. Probably a bit mm-hmm. of both. It's probably easier to do the the lead generation and get new leads than try well, and work. Exactly. It's easy just to spend money and get them coming in and try and service those, but it shouldn't come yeah. with the cost of your, the ones you've already paid for, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. You've already got a relationship with as well. And they're more likely to spend money with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've got a question around like the, so with these tools and when you've delivered a, a quote or proposal or whatever it is, um, oh, and if I'm if I'm sort of jumping the gun here, and we're going to talk about more about this in the next episode, then let me know. But the the communication side of things and how that relates to the client, and you know, obviously, you know, okay, yeah, I emailed them. Okay, great. Do they get it? I don't know. Like, like, what does that actually look like? Like, how do you make that effective? You know, when we do it, we have an email that goes out, and then we'll have a text that follows it up to make sure they've got it. And truthfully, I could count a number of times it hasn't because I've entered the email wrong or something like that, something stupid, like manually, you know? Yeah, or it's gone to spam because yeah. the people's spam filters are becoming more and more stringent. We just got a notification yesterday that Google is increasing the um, uh, increasing the spam filters around um, blocking people's email if they don't have the correct, uh, they don't have the, the correct- SPS uh, and stuff. Yeah, the in, information place and the DNS records to verify the sending. Yeah. So we're going to start to see more and more spam filtering and blocking of yeah. messages. And you don't know. If you send an email to a client, goes to the spam, you've got no idea. Yeah. So you might be going, well, no one's accepting my quotes, but they're not actually getting them. And they think you're the worst bloke in the world because you haven't sent them a quote yet. Yeah. Because no one checks their spam, spam inbox. We're seeing so, it as well. We're seeing it a lot, especially from Google to Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A big pond. Big pond's a really big one for it. Really? So email the big pond. Yeah, it's it's a real problem at the moment. So you're spot on, Matt, having that process mm-hmm. around sending it and then following it up, whether it's a phone call or it's a text message, however automated you want it to be. It varies system to system. Um, some tools, again, I'll use ServiceMate as an example. Some tools will let you set up automations where there will be some automated follow-up via SMS or via email. Email is probably not so useful because if it's gone to spam once, it's probably going to go to spam again. Mm. But that SMS follow-up I think is critical because SMS is becoming a hugely popular way to communicate or preferred method to communicate. I was listening to one of your podcasts from um, from a while back with Justin Clegg, and he was oh, yeah. talking about um, customers prefer communication via texting. It was 74% of consumers would prefer to communicate via texting. Yeah. Um, that's huge. That's got a massive open rate, ninety-eight percent open rate. Yeah, you've but- also got to play your cards tight with that. You got to because a lot of people will, <clears throat> a lot of the providers like the text message platforms and things like that. If you if you do it for reasons such as outreach, and you get a lot of unsubscribes and whatever, yeah, you you will have your account like it will get spammed. That right. and, yeah, and we've had that we that that same guy that I was saying. Uh, in the Christmas campaign, we also ran a text campaign alongside it, and the t- yeah. he's he got spammed on the text side of things. 
So because the numbers weren't as uh, as verified as he um, told us they might have been. <laughs> but anyway, oh, right. it was easy to resolve. But the point is, they, they're cracking down on all that stuff as privacy yep. hoo-ha. Yep. So you just got to do it ethically. I think with what we're talking about as a follow-up after seeing yeah, it's a fine. Group, yeah. it's different to doing an outreach campaign. Yeah, But I guess it just comes back to having your process, building your process and following that for every client. And, and refining it as you go, you might find that a phone call is a better option after sending the quote because it's a closer touch point. Just depends on how mm-hmm. much you want to make. Yeah, I, I'm always very conscious these days of over automating. Yeah, I've made that mistake a number of times. You know, like there's sometimes something nice about a physical phone call, um, yeah. a bit more tangible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's another, it's another personal touch point. Yeah, you might not want to call a client. They might. Be- I might like to talk, chat a bit too much, but yeah, um, yeah, it just it just comes down to building out whatever works for you, and and having it in trying to have it in your system. Well, so and that's, that's yeah, and that's that's actually a really good a really good point. And when we talk about, you know, I've been saying this for years. You guys aren't in the plumbing or building or electrical game. You're in the you're in the data data game, like it or not. You know, you've got to make sure that you've got the information and the you know those, those data points for your contacts especially the basic ones the you know the the phone number the full name the email and that kind of stuff because it it makes it like someone might come to you through an sms camp or through a facebook messenger message but you've got to make it part of your sales process to get their actual contact details properly you know so they can become part of your nurture sequence or even sales process in terms of quoting and sending out text messages and emails and that kind of stuff or it just won't work yeah yeah well, that highlights the importance of accuracy in your database as well. The number of times we've had, we'll do a project with a client and they'll say, okay, let's connect the software product up to our MYB or our zero and we'll pull all the customer list in. But the customer list that they've got in their accounting package is a bucket of crap. Yeah. It's got information in wrong fields. It's got yeah. it's got first names and last names combined. It might yeah. just have... Yeah, I could have anything in there. You've got to you've got to think about the the cl- cleanliness of your data and what that's going to mean moving forwards for your system. Because like yeah. you were just saying, then we want information, we want accurate information in the right place so we can use it for the right purposes. Or the big one that we see all the time when we're like you know setting up all the migrating contact lists and that kind of stuff in is the you know all of, we've got all the job the the home addresses but we don't have an email. <laughs> yeah, and like great. <clears throat> so, what are we going to do? Send out lumpy mail to all of them, like, <laughs> and you and then it's very hard to cleanse that list as well because I mean, you can put like an email list through a cleansing software and figure out how many of them are out, uh, are still are, are active emails, but you can't very easily do that with the addresses. <laughs> so, yeah. again, like getting those data points is really important. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's <clears throat> a case of starting again, totally, and saying, right, let's just start from scratch and we'll start building it from now with process in place and policy in place around what we're capturing and how we're capturing it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's almost always the case truthfully, but it's nice sometimes to be able to take some of the existing assets and hopefully re- get them re-engaged. But anyway, so cool. cool. Uh, is there anything else you good... want to talk about in this episode or? No, I think that's a good starting point. I guess it was just clarifying that difference between estimating and quoting and we've got two definitions of estimating there yeah. same kind of idea uh and then the difference between your quotes that will come out of your basic systems like your accounting packages or your simple quoting tools like invoice to go versus what can come out of a proper job management system and then how that data gets used once the quote turns into a job and how we can then track the information Yes, yeah, a, lot of people, a lot of people will say, "Well, I do quotes already out of zero. It's very different to doing a quote out of a job management tool." Yeah. Um, and then that whole workflow, the old way versus the new way, and just changing your mindset. So I know you've either done or you're talking about doing. Uh, you have done here like a blog on quoting versus estimating. So I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, yep. You guys go check that out. Um, just head across to the site shed and search Clinton. Um, and it will, it will come up, but yeah, that'll be, I think that'll be helpful to um, just give you guys a bit more of a deep dive understanding of the difference there. Um, yeah. We've done a, done a blog on um, not so much the detail that we've talked about today, but on the, the quoting and estimating and the different, different technology tools. 
yeah. the different software products that are out there and a little bit of information about each one. So it's a really good resource. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, let's come back in the next episode. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into um, like some of the technology stack and things like that. So um, I guess that's where we can get a bit more nitty gritty into the different tools and things that are available. Awesome. Um, Thank you, Matt. Otherwise, yeah, cool. Well, thanks listeners. I hope that was enjoyable. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, Just reply to one of the um, emails you get or any of the social messages you see this pop up on. Leave some comments and um, I'm sure I'll get Clinton back in the next eight years or so to answer them. (laughs) Hopefully a little bit sooner. (laughs) Thanks, mate. It's a wrap. Thanks, mate. Bye. New Zealand-based home renovation company, 6,593% ROAS. Sydney-based solar company, 2,700% ROAS. Hunter region-based bathroom renovation company, 5,616% ROAS. Melbourne-based building company, 13,182% return on ad spend. Adelaide-based solar company, 2,881% return on ad spend. Guys, the list goes on and on. If you are a trade-based business and you work with projects like roofing, solar, bathroom renovations, kitchen renovations, anything like that, head across to tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. Book in a conversation. It is game changing.